Ed Pelletella from the Erie Times News. Um, I cover the Erie School District, among other things. I'm glad to be here and um, glad to see all the candidates, many of whom I met in different um, in, in different settings, especially at school board meetings. So I think what we'll do first is um, I'm going to ask the uh, candidates to give a brief introduction of two minutes each, and we'll do that in alphabetical order. So um, if we can start with uh, Mr. Jay Brenneman. Jay, you're on for two minutes. A tight timeline. Uh, thanks, Bonnie and Ed and everybody else for this. Uh, my name is Jay Brenneman. I live in Erie with my wife, Jamie, and our three children. Elijah, who's in uh, fourth grade at Jefferson Elementary. Paige is in first grade there. And we have our littlest one, uh, Milo, who's two going on 12. Um, I am an educator. I teach at in the social work program at Edinburgh University. Uh, I also teach in uh, the social work program and political science programs of both Case Western Reserve University and Gannon University. Um, I am a full-time student right now. I'm pursuing my doctorate uh, in social work. Um, and uh, my education really began with this here. This is my GED. I earned my GED uh, about 20 years ago, uh, right before joining the military to uh, serve after 9-11. And I uh, served six and a half years in the military, uh, including three and a half years overseas, one year in Korea, two and a half in Iraq. And uh, when I returned to Erie in 2009, uh, I began, my, thanks to the GI Bill, I began my uh, education in social work and sociology at uh, Mercyhurst University. And after that, I went for my master's at uh, Case Western. Since then, uh, I served four years on county council, uh, helped shepherd in uh, the community college uh, as chairman, and also have led uh, numerous other community uh, projects. Right now, my favorite right now is the, the Tool Lending Library, which is on East 28th Street that I started. And I'm also converting a uh, formerly blighted property into a neighborhood park. Um, but uh, other than that, I'm just really happy to be here, uh, answer your questions. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, receiving uh, your vote and your consideration on May 18th. Thank you, Jay. Um, our next participant is uh, Daria Devlin. Daria, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks, Ed, and thanks, Bonnie, for hosting. Um, I saw Jay smile there. It's like we're always at the top of the list, right? But that's okay. My, my maiden name is Simon, so I'm used to being at the bottom. Either way is fine. Um, so I'm Daria Devlin. Um, I am a native of Erie, grew up on the historic East Bay front. Some of us call it the Lower East Side. Um, attended Piper Burley Elementary almost right after it opened in the early 80s. Um, went to Academy High School before it closed. Um, I did my freshman year there and then finished over at Central High. Graduated from Central High in 95, went away to college um, at Colgate University in upstate New York. I graduated with my bachelor's degree in uh, history and Russian studies, and then took some time off, uh, married my husband right after college. We lived in Pittsburgh for a while while he was in law school, and then moved back to Erie. Um, when we moved back to Erie, I immediately um, insisted that we live in the city. We bought our homes in the city. Um, sent our three children to Erie's public schools, Jefferson Elementary, Woodrow Wilson Middle School, and now Collegiate Academy. Um, along the way, I gained my uh, Master of Educational Leadership from Edinburgh University, and I went to work for the district. I was hired back in 2013 as a grant writer for the Erie School District. During my time there, I wrote the first grant for the community schools program that now has taken off. I'm so pleased to see that constantly being expanded. It's such a great program. Also wrote the grant for the Tech After Hours Adult Education Program, and then took over as communications PR and marketing for the district in 2015, um, where I had the unfortunate responsibility of helping to close a number of our schools at the time. I was part of and led the fight for funding in Harrisburg, um, and then really had the privilege of sitting with our youngsters as we rebranded and recreated um, what is now Erie High School. So I'm running because nothing's more important to me than the future of this city, and that means public education. Um, I'm committed to the district, both personally and professionally. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Look forward to some great conversation with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Daria. Our next candidate is uh, Tim Gostomsky. Tim?
Uh, I'm sorry. I forgot hey, Kim, to turn on Kim, the audio. Well, Kim, why don't you start from the beginning, okay? Sure. Well, uh, okay. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the clock, but why don't you start from the okay. beginning? No problem. My name's Timothy Kostomsky. I'm 62 years old. I'm single. I better mention my great nephew, Lucas, my three great nieces, Natalie, Emma, and Josie, because they don't believe I'm running for office, but I am. I'm a graduate of Gannon. I would have made, my major was political science. My minor is geography. I've taken several courses since then in both education and computers. I've lived in the same house on the east side, 24th and East Avenue for the past over 50 years. Okay, I'm running for office because I really think these, we need to keep a close eye on these school districts and its finances. And uh, I have a little bit about my philosophy of education. I think everybody can learn and we all need to learn, even if it's just a little bit. And this job of the school district to teach our kids that they can go ahead and learn and spend their entire life finding out new things and being able to go ahead and expand, fill their, fulfill their own potential. And that's it. And thank you again. Thanks, Tim. Um, next up is, uh, next candidate is Aaron Lundberg. Aaron, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, uh, I am Aaron Lundberg, and uh, I appreciate that you're going alphabetic order by last name, because usually with two A's, I'm always at the beginning. Uh, but I uh, live in the city with my wife, Kelly, and my four kids, Eli, Owen, Sadie, and B, and they have all attended Jefferson Elementary, Wilson Middle School, and I have two at Collegiate right now. And uh, when my wife and I got married, we felt uh, we wanted to, you know, raise our kids in the city. Uh, we love this gem of a city and we want to make sure that we're doing our part to help highlight it and allow our kids to grow up in an environment where they understand uh, uh, a mix of diversity and, and backgrounds and people that can help shape who they are. Uh, and so we very much wanted to live in the city. I've been involved from a perspective of volunteering with the school board, um, not the school board, with the PTO at Jefferson. We've hel I've helped with Title I parent advisory panels. I've been uh, pretty passionate about trying to help where I can uh, with helping with landscaping and different cleanups at some of the schools. I've helped to lead certain initiatives for some of the school projects in the summer, uh, and that's been a great experience. I've been able to uh, be blessed to be on the community advisory panel uh, with Dr. Badams, uh, which led into helping to formulate the uh, strategic plan as a parent and community member uh, for that. And I'm excited to see the direction of where that can go. And that's my hope as I get on the board. From an experience perspective of work, I've been blessed to, uh, for the last two decades plus, work in uh, multi-unit management. And that just so happens to be right now as a senior executive director through a, a local church that uh, has a nonprofit that also has a leadership center uh, that I'm very excited about and, and is also passionate about the city. And so I'm looking forward to see uh, what I can do uh, when I get on the board to bring that experience to bear uh, with the others who are on that team. Thank you, Aaron. Our next candidate is Zachariah Sharif. Zachariah, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, you're on, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, for this opportunity on the platform. Uh, my name is Zachary Sharif. Uh, I was born in Somalia, came here in '96 from uh, in a refugee camp, but I've been raised in Erie, PA, in the city for 24 years now. Uh, currently, I'm married uh, with my wife. We have four four beautiful children. Two of them, two of them currently attending. Uh, attending uh, Lincoln Elementary School. I, I myself went to the uh, pub, uh, Erie Public Schools uh, from Glover, Cleveland to Connell, Burton and graduated from uh, East High, the old East High School in 2006. Uh, after that, I continued my education at Penn State University where I received my bachelor's degree and minor in marketing. While there, I also worked at the Health and Wellness Center as a peer health educator. After graduating from college, I worked in the hospitality industry for 12 years as being a manager. And for, for those years, uh, I was a general manager. Currently I'm employed at the Erie County Department of Health as a public health educator. I am a certified tobacco prevention specialist. Uh, I'm certified in uh, 
mental health, uh, mental health with the youth and adult. Uh, and the reason why I'm running uh, for school board mainly is I want to be involved in the community. I've been involved in the community. I was a, I've been a, while going to Penn State. When I came in the summertime, I used to be a, I used to tutor at McKinley School, Wayne at the time Wayne Elementary School, and I believe that currently uh, that our, our curriculums need to be relevant for our our students. When I say that, we need like more gear of courses that that's going to get our students ready. Some some kids might be interested in. Uh, technology, science, and engineering that we need to have some of those core classes to get them prepared uh, once they want to go to college. Currently now, starting the community college, we need to develop a curriculum that will connect our our our, our students from high school if they want to attend two-year college, because we know that sometimes not every student will want to go to a four-year college. So what a great opportunity to to revamp our, our courses. Of course, we need a uh, I, I will is, advocate for it. Raya, I'm sorry, your your two minutes were, were just, you can elaborate on that and some future questions, but we need to move on to the other candidates. So we have, we're trying to keep a tight no problem. schedule here. But no problem, you. no problem. I'm sorry, Depen our next candidate is Depend Tamba. Depend, are you here then? Um. Yeah, hi, okay, good evening. Right. Good evening, everyone. I am so sorry. I have to leave. Um, this girl just. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you now. Um, sorry, I just I was just saying I have to leave. Um, that someone a girl, a little girl just came to my door. She's lost, so we okay. don't know where she lives. So I have to go help her look for her house okay so um, i'm so sorry no good luck with that and then if you want to jump on later just let us know when you're here or i'll i'll check in and then we can rotate you in if possible definitely thank you so uh, much okay thank you mm -hmm. and our final candidate tonight is leantra tate leantra you want to, like to introduce yourself thank you can you sure. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Leatra Tate. Um, I am born, I was born and raised here in Erie. Um, I attended several of our public schools. Um, I went to Emerson Gridley, uh, Harding Elementary, and then I graduated from Collegiate Academy. Um, after collegiate, I attended Edinburgh University where I studied applied developmental psychology. Um, and during that time, I had a great opportunity to uh, take an internship. Um, my final, so final semester of my senior year. Um, so I did my internship at Penn State um, CORE, uh, which stands for Community Outreach Research and Evaluation. And during that time, I had an opportunity to connect with a lot of um, youth focused organizations around the city. So uh, we partnered with United Way, we partnered with um, SafeNet and a lot of different groups who were uh, working on community-based programming um, to support youth and youth development in the city. So that gave me a, a glimpse as to what can happen when communities come together, um, when we have uh, a center on youth development, um, and when we have this collaborative sense in how we're approaching um, youth uh, progress and, and providing um, sustainable and um, important and critical uh, supports for them as a community. Uh, from there, uh, I decided to study community psychology. So I did my master's at Point Park University in Pittsburgh, um, where I focused on clinical community psychology. And then I graduated in 2019 with my doctorate in community engagement. Um, so all of my academic, um, as well as personal experiences, I believe have um, culminated into this, um, you know, sort of interest in uh, joining um, the school board to really bring all of those experiences um, into practice and make sure that we're showing up as a community in the best ways we can for our students. So I'm excited for the opportunity and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you very much. You clocked in right at two minutes. That's great. So a pleasure to meet everyone. We're gonna get started with our first questions. And um, the, the order changes throughout, so just be patient. And then um, I'm going to read the question for, for the first person and then um, and then it'll be displayed. If you want me to read the question again, let me know, but it will be displayed. 
So uh, um, the first candidate to answer the first question is Ms. Devlin. And the question is, briefly describe your thoughts about schools returning to full-time in-school education and your plans for accomplishing that. So Ms. Devlin. Thanks, Ed. So, of course, that's like the most um, pressing question, I think, on all of our minds at this particular moment. Um, I know with my own three sons, um, I will tell you that the past year has been very, very difficult for all of us, um, really difficult academically for my sons, who, by the way, have two parents here at home supporting them. So I can't even really begin to comprehend what it must be like for students who might not be that supported at home. So while I have completely agreed with the district's decision to close our schools, I think it was necessary. I think safety is always number one. I think that as soon as we were able to bring our children back, I'm glad that it happened because like I said, for us, it was imperative and I know it was for all of our students. I believe that they are learning better in the classroom. However, I think we have to continue to be vigilant. So in some of my canvassing, um, in my neighborhood and in others, I actually have knocked on doors of some of our teachers and asked them if they feel supported, do they feel safe? Um, you know, and I'm hearing kind of mixed things about that. I think we need to continue to make sure that our facilities are up to grade. Um, part of the reason, you know, that our students had to be out for so much longer than maybe their peers in the county was because our buildings were already in such a state that our ventilation systems were outdated, um, that we're already presenting health dangers to our children. So I think it's another reminder of the inequity that we face here in the city. It's a reminder we have to keep fighting for funding for our students so that they don't have to go through things that their peers in the counties do not, um, that in fact, they should be more supported than others. And most importantly, I think now that we're back in the classroom, as this relief funding comes in, we need to make sure that that money is spent wisely to help our students. I don't wanna say catch up, but certainly help them recover Cover and perhaps use this moment as a jumping off point to actually thrive and get some of the resources and supports that they needed in the past and certainly need now as we all recover from the pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Devlin. Mr. Gostomsky, would you like to uh, respond to the question? You need me to repeat it? You need to Tim? Do you hear me? Yes. Not anymore. Okay. Now do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now we got this straight, I think. Okay. Yeah. Could you please repeat it? Briefly describe your thoughts about schools returning to full-time in-school education and your plans for accomplishing that. Okay. Thank you. I believe the school should return as soon as safely possible to full-time education, because for most students, that's the best way for them to learn. Okay, the best thing the district can do to that is to take a lot of this money that we're going to get and put it into the updates into the school, into such things as improving the ventilation and other, other you know, the spacing and stuff for the students so that this can be accomplished. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Next up is uh, Mr. Lundberg. Aaron, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm gonna repeat a little bit of, of what has been mentioned. Um, I agree that as I've been walking around, there is mixed feelings uh, from both parents, uh, teachers, and students. Uh, and I think this can sometimes fluctuate between the, the age of the person, students of elementary versus high school or whatever. And there's a recognized comfort level of different uh, people with different um, backgrounds or whatever might be going on at work, whether the parent works in the medical field or whatnot. And so I think we have to think as in innovatively as possible to make sure that we're not only providing safe environments, but also providing options. And so uh, we're coming out of a, a season, especially with this infusion of money, where we can get creative with uh, what can we do online for the students that need to specifically be online, but be supported well? And how can we come around the teachers that are specifically earmarked for that? And how can we come around the, the students and the families that are comfortable coming into a well taken care of and sanitized uh, facility that allows the students to have a good proper learning environment there? And that transcends to extracurriculars, to different programs, so that the students can have that full high school experience. And while I want to applaud the uh, current you know, team and board and administration for what they've been doing, I know it's been hard 
um, as, as I've had to experience that with an organization I lead. Um, I do wanna say that first and foremost, the, the main thing that we need to make sure we're doing is providing uh, care for the students and the teachers from a mental, physical, and uh, social well-being of the environments that they're in. That This pandemic, as we all know, has taken on a, a wide array of feelings, emotions, and thoughts, along with struggles, uh, especially with the wide variety of family situations and working parents who's working first shift, first shift or second shift. Um, we have to be innovative in how we come around those needs to make sure that people are uh, taken care of by their well-being. And that's going to help us as we move into the future uh, to have the right learning environment. Thank you, Aaron. Um, next up is Mr. Sharif. Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no. So uh, the same thing, some of the things I might just repeat as, as already mentioned, uh, you know, I'm also work some days from home and my wife's a full-time stay-at-home mom. And that's even more than a full-time job. And, and you know, it was tough for our kids to be on a Zoom, let alone as an, as, as an adult couldn't focus. So I'm, I'm really happy as uh, the school district worked with the uh, Erie County Department of Health to try to make sure we have safety measures for our students and our teachers to be back in school because the best way for students to learn is in person because let's 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 face it that our our district was not built for this uh, you know they with with the virtual learning uh, one of the things that i would love to see was in the first time with the covid uh relief that the school uh received i wish they would hire some social workers mental uh, uh mental health staff to accommodate the students because being off on online schooling for a whole year and now getting back i, I know a lot of kids need that social support and I, I hopefully in the, with the next uh, school board, like we will work on getting more social workers and behavior, uh, mental health uh, staff on board in the school district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharif. Um, Ms. Tate, you are, um, you're up now with this question. Would you like me to repeat it? No, thank you. Um, so, uh, as my fellow candidates have said, um, you know, there are a lot of elements of what we need to change long term. Um, so I'll just, uh, you know, instead of uh, saying some things that have been said already, I'll say a couple of thoughts that I've had that um, are more short term um, in terms of what needs to happen um, at, you know, the start. So as we're thinking about our students returning to full time, um, as uh, Zachary mentioned, there are going to be some significant mental health um, and just socio-emotional supports that our students are going to need. Um, so I really like the uh, idea of potentially partnering more extensively and expansively with our community organizations that we have in place. Um, so I think the district would do well um, to create some of those formal or informal partnerships um, with our community organizations that have been um, long, long standing supports for um, you know, significant um, demographics and populations in our community um, to help be sort of a stopgap for that as the district is thinking about longer term support, such as hiring more um, you know, social workers and behavioral and mental health um, um, you know, staff uh, in the, at the district level. Uh, another thing that has really just sort of um, been a part of my um, thoughts around the return to schools is I wish that there would have been more of an emphasis on teachers having access to vaccinations um, as part of that plan for returning to schools. Um, our students and our teachers need, uh, you know, protections as well when it comes to COVID. So um, I wish there would have been more of um, a push to have those vaccinations offered potentially earlier to our educators as they were returning to the classrooms. Um, so those are some of the things that I uh, think about in terms of uh, short-term offerings uh, and needs. Um, but you know, there's an extensive amount of long-term um, supports that the, the district can really uh, be, can and should be at the forefront of. Thank you. Mr. Brenneman. Yeah, so I, I have a lot of thoughts, actually. So um, some of them are uh, my firsthand experiences. Some of those are from uh, teachers and parents who have reached out to me. Uh, beginning last summer, I was uh, very disappointed in the type of data and information that was coming from uh, the county in regards to uh, how the virus was being transmitted across the county. 
um, and being a, a data analyst by uh, experience, um, I put together my what I knew how to do and started sharing with people online uh, the trends and, and some of the, the things that were happening in the community with regard to the virus. Uh, and in that, um, uh, I had a lot of people were talking to me about their feelings and experiences in the workplace, uh, which the schools are also a workplace, but also for their students. And one of the things that I think uh, stuck with me the most was the lack of consistent communication or long-term planning by the school board. Um, we witnessed in October, the school board had, uh, they knew that cases were rising. They discussed that. Uh, they knew that there was going to be some disruption, but they still went forward communicating to parents and families that there was going to be this hybrid option, that people were going to be able to choose between online versus in the school. But they knew that cases were rising and that they were, may have to back down, in which they did last minute, which caused uh, teachers to have to move between buildings. It created all, all kinds of uh, problems for teachers and educators, but also for families. Uh, and, and then all throughout, even up to you know, February, this, this messaging of play it by ear. I think it's our, our role as uh, school directors to focus on not just the, the idea of going back to school, but the idea of safety of our children. All too often, the, the discussion of safety is really about risk. What risk uh, is to the children and how much that risk can uh, we afford? And also, it's not always thinking about every person within that frame of risk. So I think you know communication needs to be more consistent, planning needs to be more long-term and we need to really consider safety first and foremost. Thank you. Next couple of questions are gonna focus on uh, finances. So um, our, our second question um, and the first person to answer this question will be Mr. Uh, um, Kostomsky. So this, the question is, the administration has, the administration of the Erie School District has proposed a $208.6 million budget for 2022, which includes a 3% increase in taxes. Explain if you support or oppose that proposed budget and why. Tim? Here we go. Now do you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, since it is part of the uh, the rescue money we got from the state that they are going, to, we need to demonstrate that we are willing to balance the budgets and set up, uh, and set up, you know, long-term stable budgeting. Uh, fortunately, we're probably going to have to go ahead and have that tax increase. And I own two properties in the cities. I mean, as a property owner, I may not like it, but sometimes you have to do things you don't like to do. And to get the district out of the long-term hole I had, I had been dug into, if we're going to have to sometimes bite the bullet and do things that we may not want to do. So I would tend to support something like that as long as I saw the increase was what was absolutely the minimum necessary. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Lundberg. Um, I, uh, the only pushback that I would have on the budget is does the, does the potential increase need to be at 3% or can it be 2% like what, uh, maybe the requirement with some of the help that we've been getting from the state, because we've had such an influx of, um, money, uh, of over hundred million dollars coming in, uh, in excess for, through these relief, uh, funding acts. But the reality is, uh, we are still not into the safe zone of uh, reserves and how we're managing our assets completely. And uh, that's gonna take just some trust and understanding and patience from the community because there's been a big writing of the ship that we have had to, you know, that our board and, and the administration has had to work on. And we've, we've come a long way, uh, but we need to continue to demonstrate that we can't just automatically not have um, tax increases or uh, where costs are going up I mean, costs for lumber is going up, different costs are going up for a variety of things. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to take care of, of our programs currently in place, not just what's gonna come with this funding, uh, but also that our teachers are taken care of, that students are safe, and that we're continuing to elevate our programs and what we are offering through curriculum and standards for our children, uh, as well as build up a, uh, a proper fiscal plan that plans for new things in the future that 
um, we quite frankly didn't do in the past. And so we need to be prepared for the next roof leak. We need to be prepared for the next problem. And we have a bunch of building issues to still repair. Uh, so it's not just programs, it's buildings too. And we need to be able to do that well so that we can forge into the future. And that in future years, after this whole recovery plan and uh, just the strategic plan that we're doing to get to the right funding place, that we're not constantly doing three year and four year or 3% and 4% and 5% tax increases in future years. We need to right the ship now, but we have the momentum and the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Sharif. So, so I believe uh, with, with the budget and I don't know how long this is going to be sustainable to just increase, uh, put the burden on, on taxpayers in the long run. But, you know, right now it is what it is. However, I know just after sp speaking to the superintendent, he spoke about even after receiving the funding from the, f uh, with the, with the Rescue Act and whatnot, they, this helps only short term. This is not long term. The school after that money is out, they're going to, we're going to be in the, in the whole 7.3 million every year after that five to seven years. So we have to find other ways. We have to look at the budget closely. What, what are some of the high cost things that, 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 that is on a budget that can be eliminated and whatnot? Because after all, like we see the de decline in, in, this, in the city and people are moving out the city and you can't just keep burdening the city taxpayers. Of course, we have to take responsibility. Uh, I myself own a few properties and I'm willing to pay the taxes, but how, can, how long can each person do that? After a while, you're gonna see people leaving the city. Of course, we, but we have to do is advocate for funding. We need to work, uh, school board need to work with, with the mayor's office. We have to figure out what, you know, what can, what else, how, how else can this, the school district get money? Because in the long run, like, like I've repeated many times, we just can't move forward to increase, uh, to, you know, increase taxes or whatnot on, on, the, on the citizen. Thank you. So that's my take on that. Thank you. Mr. Brenneman. Yeah, so this isn't uh, new for me, you know, serving four years on uh, county council. I've been directly involved in four budgets, each totaling uh, about $400 million, including uh, just under $100 million that uh, every year is raised through uh, property taxes. I've been through uh, five budgets, though, technically, uh, on top of that. Um, so I understand the, the, the political ramifications and the challenges it comes to, to making these types of decisions. Uh, I understand that there's some push to raise these taxes in order to kind of, you know, get us out from under the uh, that supervision as quickly as possible. I do not support the tax increase. I think what we hear year and year, year after year with every level of government is when they talk about, well, we need to, you know, we have to, we don't have any other choice. Well, we do have certain choices. Uh, one, of course, is advocating as, as uh, uh, loudly as possible uh, for the funding uh, changes that uh, Governor Wolf has um, recommended. But also on top of that, uh, locally, uh, we need to be advocating very strongly with uh, the city and the county, particularly the city, because, because of their uh, zoning and land use policy and other policies that uh, prevent us from actually, you know, receiving, you know, people from uh, buying and building homes uh, on all these vacant lots you see, preventing people who are stuck in, in the cycles of renting, and they're, they're paying more money towards renting than they uh, could if they actually own their home, and it's city policy that's preventing them from owning homes on these on these properties. And so we need to advocate for more for more people to be able to own uh, homes and have properties, uh, and so that there's more tax revenue coming in. If we if we have more housing options for people, housing policy is school policy. That's where the the math, the vast majority of our funding comes through. So. You know, no on the taxes, but we need to immediately start working with this and, and pushing the city to change those rules and the legislature uh, to give us the funding that we deserve. Thank you. Ms. Tate. Um, so in a, in a certain sense, um, you know, our individual uh, perspectives and ideas on whether or not we agree or disagree with the tax increase is a moot point because uh, back in 2017, we received that $14 million as a district um, in order to help, you know, write our budget um, or support our budget at, at the district level. Um, and so as part of that, we were entered into this, uh, you know, sort of recovery plan, recovery plan that included um, annual tax increases. And so, um, you know, I think 
as we sort of think about who will be um, joining the board, uh, you know, amongst the candidates that you see here, uh, many of us are probably against it. And I think a lot of us are, are interested in exploring what the alternatives are so that we aren't continuing to put that burden on um, the, the community members. And so that that's not driving folks away from um, buying homes in our city. Uh, you know, community members across the board, but also teachers, right? Because there's an implication for our teachers not being able to afford to live in our city. Um, so when we think about the future, I think, you know, um, that's a really important point um, that, you know, community members and voters be clear on is how people stand once we get to that period where we don't, we're not forced to um, continue to make those tax increases as part of the plan that we're currently in. Um, but I agree with uh, Jay that it, it really comes down to, um, you know, the community advocating at the local level with our, our city council, uh, at the county level with our county council, at the state level, uh, to make sure that our le legislatures are clear on where our community stands. Um, because I think for far too long, Erie has really, the city of Erie has really uh, taken the burden of what has been long-standing, decade-long uh, mismanagement of the budget at the district level. So I am not in support of the tax increases, but I understand why they're continuing to happen, and I think we need to um, be mindful of how to move forward without them. Thank you. Ms. Devlin. Thanks, Ed. So, you know, so many great things that I heard today um, in this conversation. Obviously, this is a big one. So I just, I think, have three quick things to add. So first, I absolutely agree that there's more we can be doing at the local level. So our pilot agreements need to be looked at. Um, nonprofit status needs to be looked at. So my nonprofit bought a building from the Erie School District, and in the deal, we agreed to pay property taxes on that building and on that property. We didn't have to, but we did it because we knew it was right for the city. And I think certainly there are some nonprofits that can't, but some can. And we really need to look carefully at that and see what really can be done about nonprofit status and, and who is not paying property taxes. Um, the other thing that I really wanna say is I sat in the rooms with the folks from the state when we were asking for that 14 million and Leah was totally right. There was an accusation of mismanagement but the accusation was that the board for so long had refused to raise taxes that it had put us in this position. So I think the superintendent is absolutely right. Let's get out of this recovery as quickly as we can. That means yes, abiding by the plan, raising the taxes this year. Let's get out from under that so we have full local control here and then let's revisit the budget and see what can be done with some of these other local initiatives that have been mentioned. Um, certainly we know that it's a huge burden on our taxpayers, but I personally as a school board member would rather see a taxpayer count on an annual 2% increase than not see an increase for years and all of a sudden come along to a seven or 10% increase, which was something that was really being threatened for a while. That in my mind is totally unacceptable. So if we educate our taxpayers, if we help them see how we're just covering in cost, you know, increase of cost as we go, at least it's something they can count on rather than hitting them with something totally unexpected. We know that our community not, cannot stand for that. Thank you. Um, our next question is, touches on something that Ms. Devlin just mentioned. Um, so it's also regarding fi finances and Mr. Lundberg will answer the question first. And it is, do you think the administration's plan to remove the district from the State Department of Education's financial watch program by the 22-23 academic year can be accomplished? Why or why not? Mr. Lundberg. Um, I, I do believe it can be accomplished. I believe that it is aggressive, but I think that while we are coming alongside uh, the taxpayers and, and putting an additional burden on them, the administration and the board needs to continue to take a proactive approach to what we are doing and what we are helping to provide so that families, when they are getting offered a job at Erie Insurance or somewhere locally, Wabtec, wherever it is, uh, that they look at Erie, the city of Erie, as a place to move into and that we start to figure out a place where we can continue to bring tax revenue in that way by new uh, acquirements by new families moving in and by additions to what that can mean for what we can do for our buildings. I think that just uh, people who are thinking about moving into Erie, they consider different school districts and they look at curriculum, they look at programs that are offered. We have incredible teachers. All my kids have had great experiences with our teachers. What they have not had great experiences with is some of their programs, 
some of the care and support that is there for them and that we need to be bringing around all of our students and the quality of some of our buildings. Uh, we can barely mow some of our buildings properly. And I know that that's a, a stick in the side for some people uh, to think, why do I keep bringing that up? I'm not gonna buy a house if the, I go to look at it at an open house and the lawn's not taken care of, it's not properly cared for. I won't even give, the first impression is a huge aspect. And if we can't present a, a good first impression to what people are seeing when they look at our extra, extracurricular programs, it's always a hard word for me. And uh, the, the buildings and our facilities, they're never gonna give our amazing teachers, our uh, support staff inside a chance. And we need to entice people to show this is a gem. We have great schools. Sorry if they don't look on the outside, we're putting money into making sure that your kids get not just a good education, but good programs. Uh, there's a, a sports uh, that work for them, extra, extracurriculars that work for them and a building that entices them to wanna learn. Thank you. Mr. Sharif. Mr. Sharif, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Are you there? Yes. Uh, so I definitely think that the school district could be out of the financial by by that time. However, it just goes back to the basic investing in our kids who graduate from this from these schools, building a curriculum that's really court for them to find a job here having if it's a trade trade trademark work that they can do within the city because often what, what happens is kids they graduate they don't want to stay here a they cannot find the, they cannot uh, sorry my kids in the background they cannot find a job here so they go elsewhere and and that's just another tax money that's being that's being lost here in, in, in the city so it just it's going back to the core as as already mentioned that we just have to uh make make sure that uh that going back to the basic that we're building our our students up and uh they, they have the right curriculums for them to graduate hopefully find a job within the area here, here working with those big corporations how they can build curriculums to hire uh our students here thank you um miss tate Thank you. Um, so I would say I agree with Aaron that it's um, it's ambitious for sure, but I think um, this is something that we need to be uh, and make a, a ambitious goals um, and aggressive goals and aggressive plans towards. Um, I think there's an opportunity there, um, as you all you know probably know, with the the money that we're getting with the Recovery Act, a lot of that has been earmarked towards some really important um, elements that we need, uh, such as our student support programming and um, student support offerings from. Um, that mental and behavioral health side of things uh, that we haven't had or been in the financial uh, place and position to do as a district. Um, and that, fun that funding isn't necessarily in place for us to write some of the, the previous budgetary um, challenges that we've been faced. So I think that, that uh, you know, the, administrative, the administration's decisions to earmark that money towards, um, you know, sort of future focus, um, uh, programming and offerings is is critical um, in conjunction with the plan um, to uh, you know get itself removed from um, this financial watch. Uh, part of that is uh, you know we don't necessarily have a financial advisor who's uh, part of that decision making anymore um, as they left last year. Um, so that is you know something that while it's an aggressive um, and ambitious goal, it's it's something that's also still very real and there's still some um, critical uh errors that you know can can throw a wrench in that but i do believe with the right um goals and and with folks who uh, are understanding of the holistic approach uh, that needs to be um part of the the future of you know what our budget looks like um it, it's possible I, I agree with that that it is possible thank you thank you mr brenneman i i think it's worthwhile uh the, you know, anybody here who makes it through and gets elected as a school director, you know, 
we're, we're mostly going to be getting, just like with a, a possible tax increase, we're going to be uh, living for at least the first year, our first year, with whatever decisions the current board makes. So I, I'm just hoping that they make the right decision. But um, as I tell my policy students, uh, I tell them that, you know, policy is written, can be unwritten, and can be changed. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that uh, we just uh, accepted it, but I haven't seen the type of uh, vocal, uh, um, you know, the vocal uh, advocacy in order to not accept accept what we're in. There's no reason, you know, the when when you see these type of policies, when you see even when it comes down to what people deal day to day, whether it's qualifying for uh, for SNAP, qualifying for uh, education benefits, you name it, um, unemployment. There's this draconian sense of like you did something wrong or. Uh, you need to meet these certain goals in order, you know, our own, uh, you know, these 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 perceptions of moral failing, failings or bad decision making. When in reality, the problem with this all started with the state. The state legislature owns the problem, but they're they're forcing us to to adopt this as it's our it's our problem, it's our mistakes that we made. Like like Dari was saying, you know, is as if something that we did, and then we have to make uh, more challenging uh, decisions. That hurts us still in the end. It still continues to hurt us, and so they're hurting us twice with having kept this funding from us uh, all these decades, uh, giving us uh, a little bit more but not enough, and then forcing us through to jump through these hoops that we shouldn't have to jump through. And so, uh, you know, I, I think we need to meet uh, this and just uh, not only try to to live within the the, the guidelines that was set, but also to. Uh, to voice opposition and to try to get us out from it to begin with, because that can be done as well. Um, you know, the advocacy to do that uh, is what we should be fighting for. Thank you, Ms. Nevelin. So I absolutely think that it's a goal that can be achieved. Um, this district has done amazing things in the past number of years, and we have amazing teachers, as has been mentioned. I think our administrators are truly committed to the work that they do. Um, we know that there are families who care deeply. And so, yes, I think that this is something we can achieve. What I'd like to see us do is put this behind us and then renew um, the aggression with which we continue to fight for the full implementation of the fair funding formula. Um, I am tired of the fact that our children always get less than their peers in the county. I'm tired of it. I know other parents are tired of it. Um, and so it's time for us to truly get back on that. And I think part of that is continuing a legislative relationship. You know, when we started this fight back in 2015, when the bottom was falling out, um, we had to reach out and build these relationships with our legislators. And then those were strong for a number of years. Um, when I started the Foundation for Areas Public Schools, one of the first things we did was hold a legislative breakfast to bring in not just our state legislators, but as it's been mentioned, our city council, our mayor, our county council, so that everybody understands the full scope of the problem. We did that really well for a certain number of years. And I worry that perhaps once it was seen that maybe we're okay, that stopped. We need to have strong legislative connections all the time on an annual basis in my mind. The superintendent should be giving a state of the district address to our families in addition to our legislators so that everybody is always aware of exactly where we are and exactly what we need. So let's get out of recovery and then move forward with some of these things for the future so that we can make sure that this never happens to us again. Thank you, Mr. Gostomsky. Uh, yes, I would be highly supportive of every effort to get us out of this recovery from the state as soon as we can, because once we get there, then we can start charting our own course again as to what we want and what we want to how to do it. I mean, you know, the state set certain requirements when they gave us stuff and we need to live up to that part. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our next question is a financial question again. Um, in the rotation now, uh, Mr. Sharif will answer this question first. And it is, the Erie School District expects to receive $60.7 million in federal COVID relief funds. What do you want to see those funds spent on? Realizing that there are pretty strict guidelines for how the districts can use the money. So Mr. Sharif, So I think I've touched on this question, uh, on this answer a little bit earlier, but uh, so we know that, of course, some of it is gonna help with uh, making sure like the school district is uh, balancing its budget. That's 
as I was told, that's what they're going to use trying to, within the next five, seven years, use some of that money to help uh, budget. However, also, uh, as I mentioned, we need to hire more of uh, the social workers, uh, mental health and behavioral health uh, staffs and making sure that we have a, continue to have the safe, safety measures for our, our, our students, our teachers, and all, all, all the staff in the, in the district. And of course, and I know this is not discussed, but one of the schools eventually needs to be, is gonna be renovated or even rebuilt, uh, which is uh, Edison. One of, I don't think it even passed the, uh, the co coding as far as uh, ventilation goes. So that's gonna be something that that money might, is gonna be used for. So that's how I see some of that money being used. Thank you. Ms. Tate. Yeah, so I've um, touched on this a bit as well. Um, I, I know that um, some of that money is going towards um, providing those uh, supports. I'd like to see student support officers who uh, you know, are resource coordinators for our students and families in the district. Um, and I know the district has, as part of its strategic plan, um, uh, they're working towards making efforts to uh, bring in some of those um, staff people who can um, work to support our students and their needs in the everyday and make sure that they are uh, getting the appropriate supports in the schools um, that they need. What I would also like to see, however, is um, more of a leaning into the community schools model um, from that sense, as Daria mentioned. Uh, it has, I think, been a wonderful um, opportunity for our district to uh, be able to provide more um, you know, opportunities for our families, but I'd like to lean into that model a bit more and have that be a, a more robust presence in the communities. Um, I'd really love to see, um, you know, instead of, you know, just offering, uh, you know, dentists and doctors uh, as they're currently doing, how can we provide workforce opportunities for our families? Um, how can we provide opportunities to get our, um, you know, the parents of our children connected to, to job opportunities? So again, that goes back to community engagement in its truest sense. Uh, we need money to, to fund, um, you know, programs like that, but I think we have a significant opportunity to do so. Um, and that would address many of the issues that became prevalent and sort of rose to the top um, that COVID has presented over this past year. So I'd really like to see this money go towards our students, supporting our families um, in, a, in a truly robust and holistic sense. Thank you. Mr. Brunneman. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I, when I think about any, any, for me, any decision that we make on school board uh, has to have uh, the children and their families in mind at the center of it. Um, you know, buildings are buildings. And as we've seen with COVID, but as families have been experiencing for decades that um, the life experiences of children and their families outside the school building directly affects their ability uh, to thrive and, and to learn in, uh, in school. So uh, for me, I, I, want that, I want that to be our focus. I know that, um, uh, you know, when we think about the, the challenges that students have faced in the past uh, year, you know, my hope is that we don't talk about our students as from a sense of being behind because they've survived this. And um, I think we need to focus on those types of supports that uh, the children and their families need in order to be successful in what the future, what they're going to have to face. And for me, that means, you know, what's happening over the summertime, what's happening, you know, weekends, you know, and hours after school, all those things that um, our children and their families need and, and to make sure that we're still investing in those uh, the things that are adaptable because you know although the vaccine should be uh, available to most school age children by the end of the summer we're still uh, you know, facing you know deadlier forms of the virus and and um, and unknown disruptions that may happen in the future and we have to be prepared uh, and understanding that you know things aren't just going to be back to normal you know, in a few months and that, you know, this money can't fix normal or create normal. And it certainly can't uh, fix all of the, the problems that uh, have been entrenched in our communities for, for decades for a variety of reasons. But uh, for me, I would want uh, those funds to be focused on the experience of, of the children, the families, well, you know, let's, let's hear from them. Let's hear uh, what their priorities are, uh, if, uh, whether it's uh, buildings or education and other resources. Thank you, Ms. Devlin. 
Thanks. So yes, certainly, um, you know, agree with with many of the things that have been said about supports. We absolutely need to make sure that that we do that. But um, I'm a grant writer by trade, and I know that when you get grant funds, spending them on personnel can be a little risky because then at the end of the grant funds, you still have the personnel, and you better find the funds to keep them on, or have to make hard decisions about layoffs, which no one likes to do. So I'd like to see the first thing we do is spend the money on one-time purchases. So upgrading our technology. Um, that's the technology our teachers use. It's the technology our students use. I mean, we've seen for years kids in the county, kids in the private schools, you know, one-to-one -one system. Let's make sure that we upgrade the technology. Let's make sure we upgrade the facilities, as has been said, but I want to add our athletic facilities as well. I mean, I know that that's something maybe not as important to everyone, but, you know, if you've been to Erie High recently and you've seen that swimming pool, that swimming pool looks exactly the way it looks like I when I swam in it 25 years ago and probably many more years before. Athletics are important to many, many kids. Let's use the money to improve those facilities as well. And while we're talking about athletics, let's make sure all of our enrichment opportunities are strong. That's weekends, it's, it's after school, it's summer. How do we do that? I think a huge issue we have, you know, back in the old days, we used to bus our kids home from after school programs and that made it possible for more families to participate. Now we don't do that. We haven't had the money to do it. And so I definitely think that expanding enrichment opportunities, um, increasing our busing, making sure that all of our kids who want one get a ride on a yellow bus where they're safe, um, I think that's incredibly important as well. Um, let's make sure our curriculum is stable. You know, we've gone back and forth with a number of different um, processes over the years. We got to include our teachers in that conversation, make sure they're good with what we choose, stabilize the curriculum, make purchases. I don't want to hear anymore that there's not enough books to go around. We just, we can't allow that. Speaking of books, our library, certainly we know we've got I remember back in the day at Lincoln, you know, books from, from the 40s. So um, I think those are just a few ways that are one-time purchases we can spend those funds. Thank you. Mr. Gostomsky. Okay, yes, I definitely agree. Uh, you know, some of this money is coming with strings and you have to follow those, but it's basically one-time money. So it should be sent on, spent on things as infrastructure upgrades, infrastructure repair. Many years ago, when I was at a practical committee, so I was, and this was the early 90s, I was being told they still had wiring from when the building was basically built. And they were trying to put computers and stuff in on that. We could have a chance here that bring the facilities along the facilities up to date so that they can go ahead and be used into the future and repaired for that. And as and new personnel and other things should be thought of as reoccurring expenses and taking care of the recurring budget. So that's how I think that we should be spending our money, our one-time stimulus money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Uh, a lot of good thoughts. I echo a lot of them. I think that successful teaching and learning best starts with accessible uh, mental, behavioral and physical health programming and services that are needed that are needed for every unique situation that we have in our district. And so that includes quality athletics and extracurriculars that match the high standards that we have and the expectations we have for our students and the teachers who teach them. That we have inviting uh, buildings for all stakeholders and support staff and that enter our buildings, the, the people who enter our buildings, and that it demonstrates the respect that we have as a community for all who enter our doors and how we educate in them. That we provide adequately for our teachers and our support staff in the district, uh, that ensuring that not only do they have the time, the resources, but the safe areas, uh, environments needed for success. But I will say, ultimately, all of this doesn't matter if we don't listen first. We have done a really good job of bringing in an expert to help us with a strategic plan. We have done, uh, well, we're in the situation where we have experts and, and people uh, helping us from the state with our finances. Uh, we need an aggressive plan to talk to and communicate with our teachers, our students, our parents, and our support staff for how to best meet the needs of their children coming out of this pandemic that we have this funding for. If we just go and first make a bunch of decisions from what we think is best, that's not gonna work. And so we need an aggressive plan and maybe it's gonna take some of the funding to get a bunch of people in the room, to, to get out to different parents, to understand better what their needs are 
as we're trying to solve this and use this money wisely. And I think sometimes we miss the buck with who we communicate with that the board can sometimes make decisions and not fully understand the ripple effects of how that decision might affect the teachers, the parents, or the students. And we wanna come alongside and make the best decisions possible. Thank you. Next question, I'm just gonna drill down a little bit more on technology. And then um, in terms of the order, the order is gonna be the same for this question only because we had some people who um, weren't able to make it tonight. So it, so it skewed the order a little bit. So I don't want you to think there's a, a conspiracy on my part. I'm just following the, the, the math here. So my next question is um, about technology. Um, how do you think the district should improve technology um, whether it's using the stimulus money or other money, what would the focuses be on technology? Um, Mr. Sharif, you're up on that question first. So, so I think like we can't get away from technology. And that's that's how things are moving, and 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 we found out the hard way through the pandemic that we had we had to purchase. Uh, Chromebooks or whatever for for the students and and we can't just once we get back to normal some kind of normalcy we can't just put them away we have to still utilize them so we have to think like how can we also continue to uh, train our teachers to use these technologies and and you know uh, Daria mentioned earlier about we don't have enough money for books and what what a, what a what a good way to segue to use these uh, technology maybe get a cheaper price on uh, e-books and the kids can actually use them and every student can have. And and I think this, I mean, as, as, as bad as COVID is, it, it brought out a lot of opportunities that showed us that our, our district is, is not equipped technology. And another thing that I just want to touch base on is a lot of students don't have that capability of having access to a strong internet at their house. So we need to work with our parents uh, with the parents and engage like we need to find out that's that comes that social worker connecting with with the parents like who needs help because i can tell you i i thought I, we had a strong internet and me working from home and my two kids being on it and i still have weak internet so we need to work better at that and figure out like how can we reach out to parents make sure they have a good connectivity because teaching teaching our students the way we did in COVID is just going to continue and it's just going to make our district better so we should uh, definitely, we need to continue to upgrade our technology use. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tate, what would you like to see uh, the focus of technology be for the district? Thank you. So I'd like to see um, opportunities for teachers to integrate technology into the classroom. Um, what I mean by that is having laptops or tablets or uh, Chromebooks, as uh, you know, our students were using, have those integrated into the classroom so that it's not this big jolt and big uh, change for our teachers and our students to make an adjustment should something like this happen again, where they have to do an extended period, um, you know, uh, doing school remotely um, or virtually. Um, so more integration into uh, everyday class, everyday instruction, um, and I think that's also helpful for um, educators as well um, to have that built into, have the ability to build that into their curriculum um, and, and their instruction, because as a former uh, instructor myself uh, who was teaching uh, college age students at the time, it was a huge adjustment for me to translate my class uh, in person to um, remote at the start of the pandemic. Um, and if you're not equipped and, and knowledgeable and haven't had direct instruction and professional development yourself on how to translate and teach effectively um, through, uh, you know, instructional design um, that, that translates to remote learning, um, there could be a massive learning curve. So again, I'd like to emphasize um, teachers and students incorporating that into everyday instruction. I'd also like to see um, opportunities for us to better position all of our schools, um, you know, Erie High, um, you know, moving forward into our elementary schools um, as well, preparing them for careers um, that are more STEM focused or STEAM focused. So how can we incorporate technology into all of our um, 
courses and all of our instruction so that our, our kids are prepared for what the workforce will look like moving forward, which is a high emphasis on, um, you know, computers and technology and a high emphasis on, um, you know, science and, and all of those other fields and engineering that they just may not be having access and exposure to currently. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brenneman, technology. Yeah, so the, the key word in this question and is balance, right? And so we ask, we ask our educators, our, our teachers to balance so much already. You know, they might as well be you know, in a circus balancing, spinning plates on sticks, bouncing off their nose, right? Um, they're already expected to, to balance a lot in their classroom and also with their, you know, their professional development, um, new curriculum, uh, new methods, uh, new requirements, new forms, all those things. And um, on top of that, you know, they're, they're human beings. They got uh, family and their own things that, that they have to work with. So I, for me, I'd wanna make sure that, and I, I deal with this uh, both as, as a student and as an educator, um, I've taken and, uh, and currently do take uh, hybrid, you know, online classes. Uh, my two children, uh, have different uh, devices from um, the school district. They're both very knowledgeable on it, but they still have problems with it. Uh, we, you know, and um, for me in a classroom, I, and I do teach uh, both graduate level students and um, uh, baccalaureate level students and, and dual enrollment high school students as well. And I've used all sorts of formats of, of teaching specifically online. I actually start teaching another summer class that's fully online here this Thursday. Um, but and I've, I've taught students in different technologies, both on that some that are in the classroom and some that are um, uh, connected virtually. And there's a lot of issues with that. You know, it's, it's very difficult to chat. It's a very big challenge to, to teach these different formats and, and particularly at the same time. So I think we have to be realistic in that we're not uh, putting undue pressure on, on, on our teachers to uh, understand new technologies or to adapt to new methods uh, on top of everything they're already doing. Um, it needs to be a solution, not something else that's added on. And we have to be understanding that, you know, the different abilities of our students and our children, that uh, the technologies aren't going to be the impact, aren't going to be usable for everybody at the same. And so we can't have the same expectations for everybody. We really need to learn from them. Thank you. Ms. Devlin. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to pretend to be a technology expert here and act as if I know every single one that should be used because I certainly don't. Um, I absolutely agree that broadband access is critical. So what Mr. Sharif said, I completely agree with. Um, one of my employees from my organization, you know, we're trying to work from home. She has kids um, streaming all day with school. We're trying to Zoom. You know, the in internet strength is just not there. And so you know, I don't know that we can solve that for every single family. I'm sure that there are ways to do it. I'm always in favor of going out to other places and seeing what they're doing. I, you know, I used to say, we can't be the first urban district to face this problem. So who's doing what and who's doing it well and how can we figure that out? So maybe we can help our family solve it, but let's also invest in our community resources. I think that was said earlier, you know, hubs where, you know, we can help support the access there and families and students can gather, um, you know, after school on weekends. I mean, I, I know that we have those community organizations out there. Let's support them if we can't individually solve the problem, you know, at, at the family level. So. I think that's important. I also think let's use this as an opportunity. Um, so my sons have been lucky enough to be able to take, you know, advanced math. So at Wilson, they're able to take math at Collegiate Academy, you know, algebra and beyond. Um, and in, in when my oldest son did it, we literally had to pick him up every day and drive him back and forth to collegiate. Well, lucky us that we could, how many families could really do that? And that always bothered me. Um, so now that we have this technology, let's use it to make sure opportunities and classes are available to kids at different schools. You know, what's not available at Erie High, but is it collegiate that we can, you know, now offer virtually or what middle school students can be challenged by some of our high school courses. I think there's real opportunity here. So um, again, not gonna pretend to know exactly what those tools are, but I know that, that um, someone smarter than I out there knows how to solve those problems. And we absolutely need to bring them in. As I said, look to other districts perhaps um, and use this as an opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Nostomsky. Uh, yes, it's a great question to ask the technophobic Luddite about uh, technology. Uh, problem I, I see, and it's, you know, technology is advancing at ever increasing exponential rate on everything. Think, things I learned are, are, are no longer appliance stuff. So you have to, in the schools, you have to make sure that all your students at least have some kind of passing, a 
acquaintance with this so that they can know something. Uh, I think, you know, the best, best thing we can do, and you should look, we should look into this, is when they talk about the schools as hubs, you know, can the school, what can the schools do? If you don't have good internet, if you don't have good internet access, and many people don't, it, it, it doesn't matter. And, you know, you can, you can get a, you can get a tool and, you know, use it and fine. And then a few years later, the tool is utterly and completely outmoded. Okay. Like, you know, video games went from the old uh, Ataris up to now they're the Xboxes on whatever levels and, and such. And it's like, you know, it's, you know, technology advances so fast that I really don't know how, and I, I want to help students understand that, that you got to grasp that. But as to the actual way to do that, I, I'm not sure. But I do, you know, do think the internet access is the is a big problem is the big problem in on all this that so that if you have something you can actually get in and be able to participate because learning online and looking things up that's a great way to expand yourself thank you thank you mr Gislavsky. mr lundberg uh, to, to save time, I'm not going to go through and repeat a lot of the great answers that everyone has, has shared. Uh, there's, there's two things uh, additional that I'm thinking. One, uh, whatever we do, uh, along with taking care of the unique circumstances for different uh, families and individuals, um, we, we need to start thinking, okay, we are preparing our kids and our students to go out into a world that is going to be full of technology. It is going to be full of new technology by the time they get there. So how are we helping to train them and teach them in that? How are we providing that training and teaching for our students? Uh, what does this mean for our IT staff? Um, we, we need to be rethinking that. And that is going to take money. And a lot of people who are smarter than me, uh, I've struggled myself as I have led meetings at my organization with 25 people in person and 25 people online. And it's very difficult. So I can't imagine, uh, as Jay said, that how the teachers are, are how, having to balance that. But maybe this is a new opportunity where we can think creatively to really start to challenge the status quo and go, okay, maybe some classes for uh, juniors and seniors or a certain age group, we can expand the class size that the attention doesn't need to be as, as the same as for a kindergarten classroom. We can focus some attention there with the right number of teachers, but maybe we can have uh, 40 students attend one class at a time at a, at a junior or senior level, uh, which is going to prep them for uh, college if that's, if that's where they're headed. Um, and I also think technology needs to be, we need to continue to stay on top of it for how we are using technology in our trade schools, uh, that our students are going to leave and they're going to know and have used the type of equipment that they're going to work on when they get hired in a trade uh, to fully utilize their education in Erie's public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. We're a little over uh, halfway through um, our forum, which has gone really well. These answers are, are really enlightening. So we're going to enter now what's called our lightning round. So let's uh, keep it snappy. Um, so I'm going to ask, what would be the best single word to describe why you are the best candidate to be elected to the school board? So what would be the best single word to describe why you see, why you are the best candidate to be elected to the school board? And we will start with Ms. Tate and we will move quickly through everyone. So a quick point of clarification, am I just saying the word? Uh, I think just the word. Okay, cool. Uh, collaborative. Mr. Brenneman. Service. Ms. Devlin. Experience. Mr. Gostomsky. Skeptical. Mr. Lundberg. Integrity. Mr. Sharif. Understanding. Thank you, everyone. And then we're going to move on to kind of a, I guess, a mini lightning round here. But um, we're going to ask you to provide three brief goals that you have to promote academic excellence during your term, if elected. Provide three specific goals that you have to promote academic excellence during your time, 
if elected. And we will start on this one again with um, Ms. Tate. Okay, so three goals that I have to promote academic excellence during my term if elected. Um, so one of which has been already mentioned is um, focus on curriculum. Um, and having a steady and increasing one. Uh, the district has established a set curriculum for uh, certain targeted um, age range or grade levels for our district, but it has not been a, a widespread district level adoption of a curriculum. Um, and what that means is that our, our kids are current, our kids and our, our educators are in this sort of constant um, space of just you know, not necessarily having a set thing. Oh, I didn't realize that the time was much shorter for this one. So curriculum. Uh, secondly, I'd like to also focus on um, socio and emotional well-being. Um, so again, that's focusing on bringing in uh, this uh, student support network. And then finally, um, looking at holistic uh, support for our families. And all of that ties to academics and academic success. Thank you. We are now on Mr. Brenneman. I just got to say, you know, thank you, Dr. Leach uh, Tate for being the first one and only having a minute here. But uh, my main goals, uh, at, if I had to narrow it to three, uh, would be first and foremost, you know, academic excellence. Uh, the students can't, uh, can't thrive in a classroom if they're not thriving out in the community. So uh, that's going to be a major focus uh, during my tenure on uh, the school board. Uh, the next one is to make sure that uh, our uh, teachers have the uh, resources and the abilities and not expected to do new things or to do bigger things on top of what they're already doing, just to make sure that uh, they're uh, truly supported um, in, in providing that quality uh, education. And I, you know, I, I think I want to take a look at the, um, I want to hear from our students and not just students that we hand select. I want to hear from students that kind of go and do the research themselves and to, to report back to us what they think would help improve the learning environment. Thank you. Ms. Devlin. So uh, first and foremost, I want to improve and strengthen our guidance process. I think that too many of our students are graduating um, from our from our high schools not prepared for whatever it is that they're going to go out and do after after graduation. So strengthen our guidance process, make sure we're reaching kids much earlier to make good decisions. Um, I want to expand the community schools model, but not specifically only that, expand our partnerships, use our partners better, make sure that the strength of our community is truly coming into our school so that we can support our families and students. Um, and I want to expand opportunities and experiences for our kids. Too many of the students we know in our schools, the only way that they have experiences like visiting cultural centers or going on you know, trips to see other places is through the school. We have a little bit of funding now. Let's bring those things back. Let's expand experiences and opportunities. We know that those things often are the ones that have, that's what makes the little light bulb go off um, for academic achievement. So those are my three. Mr. Gostomsky. Uh, yes, first I would like to see that all students get the tools so that they can learn, that, that they can spend a lifetime learning things. I would like to encourage students to also to each have, develop a love of learning. It, not necessarily all dry academics, but learning just things, whatever it has to do, you know, with mechanics or, I mean, fiction or whatever else, so they can see that life is about learning new things. And finally, I would like to see more of an emphasis on our shared heritage. What, what brings us all together as people here, as opposed to, you know, what, what would drive us apart so that we all realize that we're all culturally one in, in everything together. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lundberg. I would love to see us get innovative with how we can partner with local businesses to help uh, complement the education uh, that the students are getting in the classroom. I think that that will be an enhancement to academic excellence. Uh, you've heard me say it before, it's a tough word, I'll say it again, but our athletics and our extracurricular programs that we're offering, they need to be complementary for our students to not just be learning in the books and learning at a trade, but that there's this well-rounded nature of their uh, education. And uh, lastly, and it was the most important of what we've been talking about, is just the care and support for every unique situation. Uh, if we don't do those three things, our kids are just going to learn from books and teachers, and it's going to be hard for them to fully 
uh, pay attention and thrive in the classroom without that, uh, pr those programs coming around them. Thank you. Mr. Sharif. So the first, the first thing that I would say is like, how can we improve attendance? It starts with attendance, right? Having the kids in school. And then my second thing would be curriculums, as I mentioned before, curriculums that would, that would set them, especially as they get into high school, things that, that might be of their interest. How can we connect them or have, have enhanced classes for the students? And uh, the last thing I would say, another thing is resources. We have a lot of good local colleges there. How can we connect our, once you're a junior year, a senior year, how, how are we connecting our students to these local colleges or like having some kind of somebody come in and talk to them or visiting their specific, uh, more like a career fair, but visiting a school that they might be interested of. And we have Kent State again and Edinburgh, all these wonderful uh, colleges, how basically connect them to the resources. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question touches on some of the issues that Mr. Sharif just mentioned, and that it is, how can the district address the high rate of absenteeism and dropout rate from our male African-American students? So we'll start with uh, Mr. Brenneman. You know, in, in my experience, my policy, uh, my experience in um, teaching and studying policy is that um, uh, most of our understanding and even the language that we use is shaped from a very uh, white uh, lens. It's shaped from a certain a lens of certain class. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it, the problem isn't uh, necessarily, you know, absenteeism. And for me, it's more about the learning experiences and uh, the experiences of all students, particularly um, African-American students and other minorities in our schools. Um, that uh, have to fit into this model that was developed uh, with uh, certain punitive measures in mind and, and certain uh, you know, moral values or, or other values by uh, particularly white, um, white Americans. So I, I think that we have to uh, focus on this, like why is this an issue? You know, whose issue is this? How is it being framed? And also make sure that it's not something that's being addressed without uh, the people that we're talking about. If you want to go on a little more, for some reason, the timer is only at a minute. So I will keep track of it. But Jay, if you want to talk a little more yeah, about this. Solve, solve uh, racism in education in one minute. So yeah, um, well, yeah I'd like to hear this. So. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to me, when we when, you know, a lot of a lot of the things that are happening the policy wise in schools, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the police uh, being having the present, whether it's uh, truancy, uh, other enforcement measures, some of these things that um, you know, they're, they're, they're built and, and what happens in the classroom, what gets said by teachers, what type of uh, values or, or enforcement and African American children, particularly males are, are, you know, there's this thing called adultification that uh, African American children have to go through and, and they're, they're held to a higher standard, they're treated like adults more than like children and I say there because I'm white and I don't have those experiences so uh, for me I would, I would want to understand how uh, from our all of our students, particularly African American students how uh, those experiences in the classrooms are and and to identify what policies and practices uh, should be changed so that uh, we're not holding uh, students to unfair expectations or to the wrong uh, value sets that um, uh, punitizes and, and you know and creates the um, this you know and, and also again like I said always going back to um, what's happening out in the community and households if we're not addressing uh, that first and foremost um, you know that may be a reason why um, if we're not helping families thrive in the community that um, how can we expect them just to show up to school and to, to be well in there. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Devlin. Yeah, obviously, it, this is a really, really tough issue. We're lucky to have partners that are helping us, I think, at least address it. You know, certainly United Way has taken a role here. If you go around town and see the billboards, you know, I, I think our community partners are stepping up to see it's not just the school's problem. Um, and it's not that it's the family's fault. It's that there are issues going on that, that we need to try to help solve. I think relationships and trust is a big part of it. Um, I think that over a, about a generation, this district lost the trust 
of an entire generation of, of who are now parents that were once students. Um, and so I think now to turn around and ask them to you know, send their kids back to those same schools, the relationships and the trust is not there. And it, it has to be built and it won't happen over time. It wasn't lost over time. You know, over, it wasn't, I'm sorry, it wasn't lost immediately and it won't be fixed immediately. Um, so over time, building communication, having children see people in the building that look like them is incredibly important. Um, we know that. And not just you know a janitor or cafeteria worker, we need to have built relationships and trust with the community, with the families, children seeing people that look like them, regardless of, what, of their background. Um, having culturally competent curriculum, I think is important. If you come to school and what you're learning really isn't relevant to you at all, um, how can you possibly be expected to put in that time commitment? I think that's very important. So, um, and helping our, our teachers, we've said this a number of times, you know, our teachers want to, to hear the students. They want to support our students. So let's ask them what they need. Let's provide them with the fresh development that would be helpful and just coming back to where I started let's use our community partners we have a lot of great people out there doing work in this community let's build the trust with them so they can stand next to us and build the trust with these students and families and I think that will at least be a start thank you Ms. Devlin um Mr. Dostomsky and we are the uh, two minutes is working now so thank you to uh Cam, who I, I want to thank them as well. They've been doing a great job here. So the man behind the curtain did fix the timer. I don't know how he did it, but it is fixed. So uh, Tim, do you want to uh, address the question of absenteeism? Sure. I, I don't think the problem, I don't think the solution to the problem is lowering expectations. I think it should be raising expectations. Uh, I'm like most people, I spent my entire life in Catholic schools and I was expected to succeed. And that drive... To me, that drives people up. When students aren't coming to school, we have to go ahead, why aren't they coming to school and find out that as a question. When you mentioned the community partners and stuff, we need to involve them to see, is, is, are they not being supported by parents? Uh, is, you know, is, are they seeing something that they don't like? Uh, you know, we should be encouraging We should be encour you know, we should be encouraging people when they talk about takes the village to raise a child. I mean, helping the people so they can go ahead and encourage their students to go to school and see that there's opportunity there to be taken if you will go look at it, look for it, and work for it. And to me, that's part of having a high expectation of a person. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Lundberg. How would you address, how can the district address the high rate of absenteeism and dropout rate from our male African-American students? Uh, this has been uh, an issue uh, that has been talked about. And back when I was on Dr. Badham's uh, superintendent advisory, the community advisory panel. And uh, one of the efforts then was something that was being tried is, is continually going to Pittsburgh and Cleveland and outskirts to I continue to attract teachers and support staff that um, look like uh, some of the students who are here. And um, the, I think 100% that that is a step to take, but it is also hard and that takes some time. And I don't mean to be a broken record here of, with my answers surrounding the same themes, but I think students will be less apt to be absent if they are having a complementary education, where first and foremost, they're cared for, their mental and, and, and uh, behavioral well-being is taken care of from kindergarten up through high school, but also that there are programs and extracurricular activities that are um, you know, sponsored and led by people that look like them, that provide them a, a really great environment to be in and learn and, and be mentored in. That is incredibly important and that will help them succeed in the classroom and want to continue to with standards on you can only participate in this if you're here, here and here that that uh, attendance rate will increase as we kind of meet that. Um, I think I will stick there. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Mr. Sharif. So uh, to me, I, first I would say is already some of the some of the things that's already been mentioned. Of course, diversity, uh, diversity amongst teachers. Of course, uh, but there has to be accountability also with the parents being involved. But sometimes we don't know what's going on at home or whatnot. So 
of course, accountability. I will put I put policies that's in place that's kind of not working in favor of the students. To me, a, a huge issue that I have with is when you come to school in the, one of this one of the biggest school districts. We have 17 police officers in our district. To me, like you know, our and when when you talk about African American males and and the school, sometimes you're coming to school. You're you know we're not thinking about this, but mentally, like, are you coming to school? Are you are you coming to a prison? But you have like you you've been guarded at school. I don't think it's backwards, and it's it's previous administrations that continues to add policing in the schools. If there's if there's an issue, it needs to be addressed. It should it should not be hiring more policing. Currently, we have 17 police officers in the schools. Let's talk about budget. We need to look at that. How can we move that money around? You know, it goes back to like that social work and how we're connecting. We got to find out why why are these students missing school we have to get the root cause of it but definitely diversity of teachers will definitely be a great start because there's research that shows that when kids have teachers that look like them they're more more likely to be successful and and you know and also right now they have i know the schools are having a hard time recruiting uh teachers of diverse and and a lot of kids don't look value in teachers and we need to bring that back and and that's what that's what i would say Thank you. Ms. Tate. So for me, what this comes down to is we need to honor these um, young African-American uh, male students' experiences. Um, and, you know, I think oftentimes what we go to is, you know, they're missing school and they're out roaming the streets or they're missing school and they're not showing up or they're not, you know, in this case, a lot, a lot of uh, you know, what has occurred over the past year has been they're not logging into, you know, school on time or they're not logging into their courses and staying in, in school throughout the rest for that throughout the day. So we need to honor their experience and, and ask them why, you know, it, it simply comes down to that. Um, if we think about the makeup of this city, a, a good majority of our students are living in economically disadvantage. That's the terminology that's used um, by our district uh, and our state, um, economically disadvantaged households um, and homes. And so what that looks like is for some of our students, they may be opting to, you know, not go to school because they have to stay home and take care of a sick younger sibling. They may be opting to not go to school because they have to go and make money in the community to support their family. Um, so there's lots of issues when we think about a city like Erie uh, for why we may be experiencing this issue. So I think the question needs to be, how can we as a district support that to make it so that our students are able to prioritize their education and um, have trust and faith in uh, their, their school district that they're going to be able to meet their needs in ways that they may not have faith in systems already or currently um, for a number of systemic reasons. Um, so what it means to address the high rate of absenteeism and dropout rates um, for African-American males is to simply ask them and create supports that honor um, and speak directly to their experiences as opposed to you know, providing um, you know, support that may not be um, ad directly addressing what their needs are. Thank you. Um, we have our uh, um, welcome to uh, another participant, Mr. Uh, Taiwan, Mr. T. Taylor. Um, he is uh, joining us now, so I'd like to ask him this question, Mr. Taylor. Um, how can the district address the high rate of absenteeism and dropout rate from our male African American students? And I will say that it does say Mr. T on the ballot, so if students call you that, I understand. So. Some of us of a certain age remember the A team. So we're welcome to we're uh, glad to have you. So if you'd like to answer the question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first off, uh, I've been on, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, a couple of things happened with uh, soccer and, and, and community meetings, but I'm extremely excited just from what I've heard and all the responses uh, to make it. Uh, I guess short because I don't want it to be uh, repetitive. Um, I agree with almost everything uh, everyone already stated. Um, one of the most important things I think we really need to do uh, is listen to the youth. A lot of the times we plan and, and do things um, and we do it according to what we think uh, instead of actually sitting down and getting the uh, information from them, uh, the people who are actually going through it. Um, 
the other thing is uh, just to harp on um, what the doctor said, I believe she's, um, we got to get into the homes. There's a lot of different issues going on with the homes. Um, there are single uh, parent homes. There's, there's different things um, and things that would hold uh, people back from going to school. Um, it isn't just uh, actually almost everything that everybody's uh, touched on made uh, sense. And I've heard the kids say it. So now it would be some kind of way of just coming up with some kind of plan to address those kids who are missing school, because a lot of the kids who are missing school don't even want to miss school. They actually want to be at school, but because of certain circumstances, situations, they can't afford to be at school. Um, and, it, and it's just, it's hard to uh, convince a young person um, to come to school when they can make an extra uh, amount of dollars or they can make sure that this um, brother or sister is safe at home instead of worrying about something that may have happened to them or a prior family. So um, like I said, all of the, the stuff together, the community schools uh, working together, uh, doing some different issues, handling some different issues, um, us, uh, people going into the homes, finding out what's going on and seeing what we could help uh, lend a hand to as far as um, helping them get back to school and help with the family dynamics. If it's, uh, transportation or um, um, needing more access to um, maybe even doing virtual at home. Thank you. Thank you for those points. Question is, once again, we'll be touching on an issue that came up already. As many of you know, the, the school district is uh, in the middle of revamping its police force. Um, we would expect some type of recommendations to come out soon on that. But in light of what's going on, please explain your position on the need for armed security in our schools. And Mr. Brenneman, you're up first on this question. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think uh, guns belong in a school, uh, no matter what. Um, I, th I think that they uh, bring uh, an unnecessary and, and too much of a danger uh, to uh, the environment. You know, and again, it shifts our focus on you know the the school. <laughs> You know, police and schools, I mean, that, that hasn't always been a thing. And you see that the rise of this punitive measures and the presence of, of, of police and uh, armed guards, that really started, you know, after Brown v. Board, you know, that started after the integration of the school districts. And you start seeing the segregation of our schools more and more. But then you also started seeing this this uh, development of, of changing the, these particularly urban schools would happen to be predominantly African-American, uh, ha have more of the presence of police than you find everywhere else because there is this pathology that's written in policy and it's in the mindsets of those who make policy uh, who um, uh, perceive uh, urban youth, African-American youth as being more dangerous or somehow needing to have these sorts of, of, of you know, po, you know, armed officers or police to deal with the situation. But, um, you know, what did we do before that? And what do they do in other school districts where that isn't the situation? What have we done, ever, you know, that isn't the, the solution there, you know, social workers and tons of other people who work in crisis and a variety of other settings uh, have um, and continue to interrupt violence. You know, we have to look at violence interruption uh, uh, methods and, and uh, within the schools, which, in, which we, those that funding should go towards. Um, and, uh, you know, we should address the schools from a learning environment. It's, it's supposed to be a place where you, you learn and you can thrive, not a place where um, we have this mentality of, 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 of danger and threat. And, and it's wholly unnecessary. And uh, I could go on and on because I have a lot of thoughts uh, on that, especially as a former combat vet with having guns in schools. Thank you. Ms. Devlin. Yes. So, you know, this isn't anything new, right? I mean, I, I remember at Central in the mid 90s, we were walking through metal detectors um, even back then. And, you know, I remember thinking how strange that was because once again, I hate to keep harping on it, but at least at that time, you know, our peers in the county certainly weren't going to weren't going through that. So why were we? And, and I think a lot of it does have to do with a perception about African American youth, which we all know is a complete fallacy. We know the school to prison pipeline um, is real. Uh, I think there's there's plenty of data on it. Everyone's aware that if you treat students like they're criminals in school, very often they will simply live into that prophecy and become that. 
However, um, I don't think we need to pull every single policeman out of our schools. I'm not in favor of that. I agree with Jay. I don't think guns have a place in our schools, not on one cop ever. Um, but I do think that some officers are necessary. We know that we do have in some of our schools, some students with some severe emotional issues, um, not anything of their of fault of their own, certainly. Um, I want to make sure that the officers we do have are trained in the appropriate ways to handle that, to take situations down, to de-escalate. I'm not sure they always are. Are. Um, I also think we need to add to what we already have with things like restorative justice practices. So, you know, I, I'm not in favor of pulling out every officer. I think a couple can be there. No guns. Absolutely. I agree with that. And let's add restorative justice. So when a wrong is done, we bring the kid back in with his peers and say, how can you make up for that? How can, how can the person that you hurt talk through how that felt? Um, that's happening in a lot of districts. I think there's a movement toward it in some of our schools. Let's expand that as well. Um, but absolutely, as I mentioned, school to prison pipeline is a real thing. I think we're seeing that in our, in our city um, from some of these practices. And so I absolutely agree that we need to take a fresh look at it, um, and now's the time to do it. Thank you. Mr. Gostomsky. I think it's a sad comment on the times that we live in, where it actually probably is a necessity to have, if you want safety, people demand safety, to have armed guards at places. Seem to forget we live in a world where people are willing to crash planes into buildings and blow themselves up to make some kind of point. I, when I was a kid, we never had police in schools except to come in to like give a talk about this, that, or the other thing. But as taking all the armed police out of the schools, what will people say if some crazy psycho goes ahead and does something and they'll say, well, why wasn't there somebody there to stop them? Well, we took them out because we didn't want to give the students the wrong idea. I, I really have a problem with that. Thank you. Mr. Lundberg. This is definitely a, a, uh, uh, a tension that needs managed type of area. And um, I personally, I, I don't think there needs to be the need for uh, people wielding guns in the buildings. I think that we need to have the right number of people with the right number of support so that our teachers are able to teach and not have to feel like they're uh, in trying to do all the care and support and social work that is needed. We need people who are trained to properly do that and help this, this uh, uh, disarm people who uh, might be angry or upset about something. But uh, to, to be perfectly clear, I think if there was ever a need of some sort of uh, security for someone to who might come in um, it's probably more for people who look like me than anyone else who might do something or who are all over the news doing things like that and so we need to be careful about the picture that we're trying to portray and who we're trying to protect there is a safe nature we need to provide but it is not needed with guns it's with the right people doing the right things who are properly trained thank you mr sharif To me, I, I definitely oppose any guns are in the schools, any policing. Just, just let's, I mean, just let's say what it is, is bad policy, bad policy all, all along the way. And, and who, who are they policing? And these are schools with ma majority of minority kids. And, and, and that has a, a lot of consequences mentally on, on, on these children. So when somebody says, well, people can be doing crazy stuff, blowing things up, there's more there's more policing in our school district than is is at the airport in Erie Airport. So I mean we need to we need to like we need to rethink how how we're doing these things. But to me, absolutely, I'm against policing in, in the schools. We don't need no guns in the schools. Uh, to me, it just has a negative impact for our community for brown and black kids, and I'm 100% against it. And and I'm I'm glad that the current school board is taking some kind of steps to try to downsize those numbers. Thank you. Ms. Tate. Um, so I'd just like to start with, um, you know, sort of clarifying that the, this concept of police as safety is in our schools is a fallacy. 
because if that were the case, then we would see the same number of police um, at Collegiate Academy. We would see the same number of policing at you know, Harding, but we don't. Um, so what we're seeing uh, when we are thinking about the uh, police officers that we see um, in our schools, they're concentrated and targeted at a very specific uh, type of school, thus a very specific type of student. Thus, what we see with our outcomes in terms of um, the, the students who are falling into that uh, school to prison pipeline that Daria mentioned earlier. Um, so I think we just need to be clear on what we mean uh, when we think about policing and what we mean when we, th when we think and talk about security, uh, because as Aaron mentioned, the, the threat is often in, from coming outside from the community, um, and it's not people who are being um, impacted in our schools. The students who are being most impacted are black and brown and students with uh, disabilities. Um, when we look at the statistics on those students who are, um, you know, getting summary uh, citations at the school uh, while they're in schools um, and leading them, you know, uh, to start some sort of criminal record. Um, and when that criminal record starts within our schools, it follows them into the community. So the same police officers that we're seeing in their schools are policing them outside in the community as well. So it just leads to this really complicated um, and, and, and the community impact is major. So I think we just need to reimagine what it looks like for us to think about safety in our schools. And that to me does not include armed security officers, that does not include armed police, um, but it includes um, respecting our students and their autonomy and respecting their agency um, and providing supports for them um, in a more holistic sense. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, you're on mute. Okay. There we go. Right. Short answer, uh, no. I don't believe uh, we should have any armed security in the, in the schools. Um, I do believe uh, I am a supporter uh, of policing, um, but I would prefer it be like police programming. Uh, why don't we have more minorities in policing? How, how are we going to entice them to get involved in policing? Um, I would say um, I definitely want them coming by. I remember growing up as a kid and going to uh, see the police station as long as the fire, as long as also the fire station and uh, the ambulance. So uh, encouraging careers and things like that. Those those types of things I think the police should be involved in. But uh, and emergencies, we need police. If something happens, we need to be able to call the police. But that doesn't mean that I think that they should be armed in the building. I think uh, along with all everyone else, um, there's so many different uh, other ways to go about it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to move to the um, to uh, one minute um, closing remarks. So um, we're doing great on time. Um, we're about 10 minutes away from nine. So the next question is, uh, it's a big one for the Erie School District. What is your position on charter schools, especially in terms of the benchmarks they should have to meet? So on that question, um, we will be starting with uh, Ms. Devlin. Another important question, and I'm so glad that it's being asked here. I was actually surprised at one of our um, previous forums it wasn't asked because it is so important. So here's where I stand on this. Um, first of all, I think if we're going to put benchmarks in place for our charter schools, we better make sure that they're the same across the board. Um, we shouldn't have some charter schools who maybe were started earlier or perhaps had a different kind of um, situation of how they were founded with the district have different kinds of benchmarks. We need to be fair and equal across the board with all of our charter schools. We need to be transparent um, about the benchmarks that we have, and we need to provide the supports that are needed. Um, personally, I believe that our cyber charter schools are really functioning completely outside um, the sphere of, of what's even um, working in our district. Um, so I would be in favor of, of certainly making sure that we're, we're providing benchmarks there. 
I think with our brick and mortar charters, we know we have a wide range of them. We know that in some cases, many of them were created to be um, these innovative places where new things could be tried. Um, I'm not sure that's happening in every single one, but I certainly wouldn't speak to that without having full information. So yes, I'm in favor of benchmarks. I'm in favor of being transparent about them. I'm in favor of them being equal across the board. Um, and I am in favor of providing supports as possible um, to these schools because at the end of the day, they are educating, whether, whether you agree with their existence or not, they are educating our students in Erie. So we wanna make sure that those students are being supported and they're getting what they need. And if they're not, then I think we have to take different steps. Mr. Gostomsky. Okay, I agree that if you're going to have benchmarks for charter schools, it should be the same for all. They should be, we should be able to understand them all, see them all, see whether they're being met or not. We shouldn't treat tar charter schools as an enemy because as, as Devlin went ahead and pointed out, I mean, they're meant to be things for innovations and new ways to try. And quite frankly, they probably serve some students better than the school district. And if they're doing that, then the school district would say, how are they doing that? And how can we incorporate that into what we, have, what we are doing? So I, I see being with the charter schools is something that should be collaborative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Uh, yes to benchmarks, yes to transparency and consistency. Uh, but to me, um, we, we have to figure out and learn and understand why are students going to charter schools? Is there something else we can be doing as a district within our own buildings, within our own programs that we can have that innovation, we can have that collaboration, those creative ideas where we can provide that not just for the students, who are going to the charter school, uh, but to the students who might not know how to get into the charter school or how to uh, uh, connect to that, that we're providing that in our own classrooms and keeping them as students of Erie's public schools if we can make that happen. Thank you, Mr. Sharif. I agree with everything that's said so far and and the, the, the bigger question is like, why are kids going to charter schools or whatnot? So, I mean, of course they should be benchmarked and it should be transparent and fair with, with all the other ones. But uh, to me, the question for the district should be, why, why are we having more charter schools open? Of course it's given students more option, but often not, that might not be the case. But uh, so we need to look at like, why, why are charter schools being open? How can the district do better moving forward? And, and after all, like that's money that the district is losing every time they lose a student too. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tate. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I think it comes down to what are what what is what's part of the decision making process for our families who are opting to um, go to these charter schools, and how can the district? use that, not necessarily, uh, you know, to, to demonize or, or villainize uh, charter schools, because I don't think they have to be this big, scary thing that um, uh, a lot of the conversation sort of frames them as, but I do think that there is a realistic uh, and tangible um, sort of output that we're seeing with families and students leaving um, the district and off well, going to our charter schools. Um, but part of that comes to down to what are we not offering um, at our public schools that we can be to be um, meeting those needs better for our families so that they can opt into Erie's public schools and see that as a, a place where their students are going to receive all of the supports that they need. Part of that I know is a lot of students who, a lot of the families that I've had conversations with about this topic have opted to go to charter schools because their students with special learning support needs or their students with um, you know, special needs um, in general from a socio-emotional um, standpoint are receiving better instruction in the classroom. Part of that is due to the number of uh, students who are in the classroom with them. They are seeing smaller class sizes in some of these charter schools, and so that's a direct, um, a direct thing that the the district can look at is saying how can we address this and how can we um, show up better for our students and our families so that they do see them as the best choice. Uh, when it comes to benchmarking, I'm supportive of it, um, but I 100% agree with Daria that it needs to be consistent um, across the board. Uh, I think we have this sort of um, 
you know, perspective that there are better charter schools than others here in our city. Um, but I think they all can be held to the same standard and they all can, um, you know, they need to be uh, providing adequate and appropriate um, supports um, and, and learning outcomes for our students. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, I would uh, just agree with uh, mostly everyone again and say, I uh, agree with benchmarks as long as they're fair and equal across the board. Um, and I mean, actually really fair and equal. I, I don't even understand the uh, issue really with, when it comes to charter schools because we got a lot of different students and students learn a lot of different ways. So any way that if the students are being successful, I think that that's the only important issue. Uh, if we produce an uh, successful students. So if it's coming from charter school, the public school, if we working together, trying to make sure that all of our students in the city of Erie are having, are getting the best opportunity to be successful, I think that's the, the common goal. So um, as long as everything is fair and equal, I think we sh it should be good. Thank you, Mr. Brenneman. Uh I, I really appreciate what our school district has done uh, in recent years as far as fighting for more transparency uh, and uh, uh, as, far, as far as the funding goes with uh, the charter schools and actually going out to families and kids and, and trying to figure out what they can do to, to return to our public schools. Um, I, I don't perceive or view our current uh, charter schools in our area as our enemy. I see the whole structure as problematic and as a long-term uh, goal by uh, legislatures to uh, underfund, stripped, and to gut our public, uh, public education system. You see these uh, charter schools are more often than not in the very school districts and areas that they've underfunded and cut, it, cut for uh, years and decades. You see on top of that, that um, they're not provided the same restrictions with those funds. And, and so what happens is you create this, they've, they've created, the legislature has created this environment where our public, our own families have to kind of like fight against each other. Like why are families taking their children to charter schools? Because our public schools can't provide the type of resource, the type of education and learning environment and supports that they need because the legislature hasn't been funding them to do that. And then they provided a way to siphon off those funds and provide these other education. So people would say, well, I can get a better educated at a charter school. Why do I, why do we need uh, public schools? And so, you know, that's, that's part of this, this long-term this long, this, this decades long uh, drive to, to gut our public education system. And so I think for uh, charter schools to, to continue to exist in the future, that's fine. Uh, they need a different funding stream and we need to adequately and properly and fairly, uh, and we need justice and funding for our public schools. Uh, I don't think we should be having this conversation as a, as a school board. I think it should be something uh, you know, that should have already been, been done. Uh, and I think that's part of our advocacy uh, with the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're now going to enter the closing arguments or closing. I feel like I'm in court. I'm sorry. Um, uh, just a one minute closing, closing remark. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, we'll start with you. What would you like? Uh, what would you like to say? What would you like the public to know about you in one minute? Oh, uh, in one minute, I would just say um, uh, what I've been doing. I've been working with youth uh, pretty much my whole life since I was a youth. Um, what I would say is um, the best thing is I was uh, doing a men's program with uh, some young men over at McKinley School. And uh, we walked in with uh, three other young men and uh, some all uh, young black men. And they said, uh, wait, is that the president? And then uh, the next week we came in and the guy said, uh, the young man said, Mr. T, before you leave, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, what's up? He said, um, hey, next week, next month is my birthday and my dad is in jail. Could you get him out of jail for me? I said, uh, why, why would you think I could get him out of jail? He said, well, you came to see us twice and you got on a suit. Uh, most people I see with suits are either going to court or they, they go into a, a church. Uh, we really don't see a lot of people in suits. And I just told him, I promised him from here on out you're going to see a lot of black men in suits. So that's what I would say. What's one of the main reasons that I'm running is to make sure that our young men know anything that they want to accomplish, they can accomplish. Thank you. Ms. Tate. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity um, to talk to you all. Um, thank you, Bonnie, for organizing this. Thank you, Ed, for facilitating and uh, navigating the conversation. Um, I guess what's most important to me is very similar to, to what Mr. T said. Um, I want kids in our district to see opportunity for themselves. I want them to see a future for themselves. I want them to see what is possible and I want them to be um, creative and not feel like they are confined to any one model or any one um, you know, set way of living or existing here in this city. Um, you know, part of what uh, has been most important to me in my development as a, a young person and my development as a child has just seeing education as the tool um, through which to continue and progress through my life. So I want to be part of that decision making so that our, our district isn't creating any systematic uh, barriers for our students so that they're able to create the future that they want to see for themselves in the city and beyond. Thank you. Mr. Sharif. Sorry, it was just a bad time. I was breaking my fasting, but uh, but uh, once again, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for uh, the opportunity for the platform uh, and and everybody here. Uh, to me, I just uh, I just want to serve the community that I've been involved with in the last twenty four four years since I've been in in the area, and I just want to advocate that want to make sure like we are di diversifying our our work workforce that we we are providing our students quick ones that's gonna set them apart, that we're gonna try to keep up with the technology that's that that's kind of ruling the world right now. And I just wanna be a, a role model just for students that look like me and 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 wanna just make sure that it, there's a uh, there's a pathway to finishing school, going to college and getting a decent job. And I just wanna be that person who will advocate for our students, our teachers. That's why I'm running for a school board. And, and rest of my uh, our slate mates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharif. Mr. Lundberg. Boy, as, as a parent, uh, I'm really excited about the uh, group of people that we have running. And I think that's exciting for my children and all the other children represented in the district. And so I also wanted to just thank the parents who are on and listening to this either now or later as well as those who have helped make this happen. Um, I, I would love to have your vote on May 18th because I believe that through my uh, experience in both the business and nonprofit world, especially the nonprofit world, I've had to uh, walk wisely with the navigation of various opinions and thoughts um, on how to accomplish certain things within different perspectives. And I think that has brought me to a place where I can listen and help lead uh, from an organizational standpoint uh, how can we have a listening posture to meet the needs and the requests and the hopes of the people that we are uh, helping to lead for and represent? And so I hope that we can get to a place where we continue to enhance the way we communicate with our students, our teachers, our families, and work within the community together to continue, continue to bring uh, amazing excellence to the graduates here in our district. Thank you. Mr. Gostomsky. Yeah, yeah, thank you again for having us all here. And it's been interesting listening to what everybody has to say. Uh, as a narrow, immediate focus, you know, I really want to be sure that this money we're getting in, the one time thing, is spent wisely and well to set us up for a future. I believe the most important thing for schools is to teach kids the love of learning so they can go out and, and, okay, and fulfill potential in life and, you know, be, be things, be, be, what, be what they want to be, maybe not necessarily what people think they should be. And I agree with Mr. Taylor's comment, we need to see more black men in suits. And I'd like to thank you all again for having us here. Thank you. Ms. Devlin. So I definitely want to thank Bonnie, um, and I love your backdrop there, Bonnie. There's no wrong way to PTA. I see a lot of familiar names today, um, a lot of PTO parents, PTA parents on. You all work so hard, so thank you for what you do for our students. Um, 
I've said before, um, my whole life was shaped by this district, mine, my children, um, and I know that the future of our city is these schools. Um, we fought very hard when the district was rebranded from Erie School District to say Erie's, and I'm crazy about that apostrophe S. These are our schools, our students, and this is how our city will thrive. Um, one of the parents on this this um, Zoom today even mentioned to me, we shouldn't be talking and comparing ourselves to our county peers. We should be the standard by which everybody else is judged. And that's my vision. I think that we have amazing students and families and teachers and we can do amazing things together. I'd like to be part of that. I think my experience will help me and, and serve the community well. I do ask for your vote on May 18th. Um, I am cross-filed on both ballots and would appreciate your vote. And I really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Brenneman. As a, as a parent and as an educator, but you know, as, as somebody who's dedicated their, their entire post-military career to um, teaching and also implementing policy, this is a very important election for me. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest experiences I have in the classroom is looking at my students, again, graduate students, also dual enrollment, uh, high school and uh, undergrad students, is just understanding that they're experiencing something that nobody ever has and never will. And this pandemic is going to shape the rest of their lives. And we have to, uh, we have to prepare them for that future. And for me, uh, when it comes to funding, when it comes to everything that we do with our schools, it has to have that uh, at the center of it. Are we preparing our children for this next, the next post pandemic future? Um, I am on the democratic ballot. Uh, I hope uh, that you uh, consider me for uh, one of your uh, votes uh, on May 18th. Um, just know that uh, I come with this with a passion, a policy, understanding of policy and advocacy and, and um, changing the way that we think and do things, but more importantly, to make sure that uh, the children and their families are at the core. Thank you, Mr. Brenneman, and thank you everyone for participating. This has been just wonderful to listen to. I mean, everyone's informed. I, I, I would hope to think it's because of maybe the newspaper coverage, but I'm not sure. I'll put a picture in there. But really, it was fascinating to listen to everyone. and. Um, uh, it was really something, and, and certainly um, you all certainly have the best uh, best in mind for the district. And thanks again to Bonnie Fagan and the Erie Council PTA and the League of Women Voters and the team here at CAM for making this run smoothly. And um, once again, this will be available later in the week for uh, viewers. So we hope uh, that people will take a look at it. And uh, thank you once again, and have a good evening, everyone. Uh, if I can just say, if the, here's here's my technology at work. If anybody wants to open the chat box and get your phone out and take a picture for the the links for the Erie County Council PTA and for CAM's website, and then also, as Ed said, thanks to the League of Women Voters, they will also um, be making the link available as soon as we get it from CAM, so you can find it on the League of Women Voters. Um, website and their Facebook pages as well. And I would like to thank all the candidates. Um, I would like to thank Ed for helping me out by doing a great job of moderating this forum for the Erie County Council PTA. And I'd also like to thank the attendees who were with us tonight. I hope you found the information uh, to be helpful and informative, obviously, if you did. Please tell your friends and share and spread the word about looking for um, the recording about the link. Hopefully this week, we'll be sharing it as soon as we get it from Cam uh, Erie. And thanks again, and everyone have a great night.